Hey everyone, for this video, we're gonna talk about anti-maskers. Anti-maskers have been one of the odder issues of the pandemic, and while statistically speaking they're a small issue, I think that they're fascinating. Terrible, terrible people, but fascinating. The thing that to me is so interesting about anti-maskers specifically is that I can kind of understand people who are against lockdowns or don't trust vaccines. They're wrong, but I can understand them. Masks are different. You can see every part of them, you can even make them at home. There's obviously no risk in using them, and while I cannot wait to stop wearing them, they're a really minor inconvenience. So why, out of every injustice that's happening right now, latch on to this issue? There's just a few pieces of fabric and a couple strings. At what point in that process does Bill Gates smuggle a tracking chip or an adrenochrome harvester in? This is also a bit of a personal issue for me, since for a while these clowns were having massive marches through Toronto and my apartment was on their route, so I'd have to deal with them bothering regular, conscientious citizens like myself who are just trying to mind our own business by sleeping in until 3 in the afternoon. This is also possibly not a particularly relevant issue since most of my audience is American and we are on our way out of this pandemic, at least in the global north, but they're still up here in Canada where I've got three more months to go before I so much as get my second shot, let alone we start reopening. Enjoy your summer, fuckers. Also, throughout this video, I'm gonna try to avoid being mean to anti-maskers as much as I can. While I do have the utmost contempt for these people, I'm gonna try not to poison the well too much by making them look stupid. They do a good enough job of that on their own. Thinking for yourself endangers the common good. Body contact causes suffering. You are under arrest for assault. Two counts. Hey, I have to take the man to custody. I have to touch him. Okay, he's now in custody. No, you're not going anywhere. No, you're, you're under arrest, I said. This is citizen's arrest for assault times two. Winding your health is excessive. Closeness is dangerous. Sterility is essential. All right, I'm Dave Rubin and we're doing something a little different today. I am live in studio with my guest who is just outside. I have not seen him yet, but I have been told that he is wearing a tiny mask. <laughs> Michael Malice, welcome to Thank the you, Rubin Dave. Report. Good to see you. It's good to see you again. Can I feel your face? Yes, feel my face. Back off. You can touch right now. There's already one assault charge coming. Yeah. He's got this too. Yeah, it's bad. For him. Uh, nope, get out of here. You're in his face? You get out of here. You're not he's wearing in, a mask. He's in my custody. Face. Um, I have a feeling we're going to do the entire interview this way. Of course. This is, we can't joke around. No, this, no, this, this is, is serious. This is playtime. Yeah, yeah. I don't is... want to kill your grandma. No, thank you. They're both dead. The government is your family. The new normal is here. <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies love you. Sir! Both these guys. Both these guys. Put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest. Oh, both these guys. Put your hands behind your back. That's it. Here we go. No, here. Give me your clothes. Okay. Put your hands behind your back. Sir. Put your I hands behind sure. your back. I'm so now let's dive in and figure out why these people are like this and what that might mean. As always, let's start by looking at the history. I swear to God, I didn't plan to make my videos this way, but I've realized now that this is a part of basically every video. <laughs> Something that's pretty interesting about anti-maskers is that while past pandemics have been the source of conspiracy theories dating back as far as you can go, 
anti-maskers are kind of a new thing. A lot of articles I've read have said that there were anti-maskers rampant during other pandemics, but that doesn't seem to be the case. While there were people doing stupid shit like poking holes in their masks so they could smoke while wearing them, which like, imagine how gross it would be to wear that mask. But also, it doesn't seem like that was as much a matter of organized opposition to mask wearing as much as it was due to the fact that people really didn't know much about masks and the standards for what qualified as one were incredibly loose. Like, the government was telling people to make masks at home out of cheesecloth, so I don't really think people fucking that up counts as anti-masker shit. An organized anti-mask movement has only ever happened once before, just over a hundred years ago in San Francisco during the Spanish flu. While San Francisco wasn't as decimated by the Spanish flu as other parts of America, it was still brutal, and while things could have been worse, they could have been a lot better. One big advantage that San Francisco had was that it was one of the last cities in America hit by the pandemic, so they had the advantage of knowing what they were in for. A piece of advice that they received from Philadelphia read, Hunt up your woodworkers and cabinet makers and set them to making coffins. Then take your street laborers and set them to digging graves. If you do this, you'll not have your dead accumulating faster than you can dispose of them. So that's grim as fuck. Really puts the wash your hands for 30 seconds advice we got early on the pandemic into perspective. Having received this handy tip, the city did what you would probably expect and completely ignored it. A key thing to remember here is that the Spanish flu hit during World War I, and so in the early days of the pandemic, there were all sorts of parades to encourage liberty loans going on, which, not great. That said, this likely wasn't the cause of the early spread. While the parades obviously didn't help, the real issue was the workers crammed into crowded shops and factories. It took a while before the city began enacting lockdowns. As cases climbed, people got scared and avoided going out as much as they could. Indoor spaces were eventually closed down as hospitals became overwhelmed and they brought in every doctor or nurse they could find, along with teachers, priests, and nuns who all volunteered to help as well. While San Francisco never wound up with overflowing morgues, basically all of the city's most basic services like telephones and garbage disposal were brought to their knees. But then in October of 1918, the chief of San Francisco's Board of Health, Dr. William Hassler, almost single-handedly ended the first wave of the pandemic with his radical idea of getting people to wear masks. Also, while some parts of the story read almost exactly like what we went through in 2020, some parts are ridiculously quaint by current standards. For one thing, a guy named Hassler hassling people to wear masks? Dude's career would not have survived today. The memes alone would have ended him. Hey Hassler, more like... Actually, no, just Hassler works. Now, while masks seem pretty basic now, I wasn't exaggerating when I said that it was a radical idea to get ordinary people to follow the same protocols that doctors did. Originally, it was seen as too difficult to enforce and was only recommended for doctors and those sick with the flu, then some store clerks, but eventually everyone. Masks were pushed really hard, even more so than the vaccine that was coming out. One newspaper wrote, It will soon be impolite to acknowledge an introduction without a mask, and the man who wears none will be likely to become isolated, suspected, and regarded as a slacker. Like a man of means without a liberty loan button, he'll be shy of friends. And it worked really, really, really well. Hassler explained very effectively that the virus had an incubation period of like two to three days and told people to wear masks and that while they wouldn't see an effect right away to give it a few days and they should see a reduction in cases after that. And as expected, about five days after the mask mandate went into effect, there was a massive reduction in cases. 
Now, Hassler was described as a massive keener. He insisted that masks be worn until a week after the last flu case. But as we'll see, that was wildly optimistic. Basically, people got real sick of masks real quick. This was for all the obvious reasons. Masks do, after all, suck to have to wear. But also, very tellingly, as Alfred W. Crosby wrote in his book, America's Forgotten Pandemic, Others of a more thoughtful cast called masks a humiliating and unconstitutional interference with personal liberty. Above all, masks were just too absurd and depressing. We'll come back to this soon, but it's incredibly telling that Crosby describes the type of people who were and still are anti-maskers as a more thoughtful cast. The kinds of people who tend to find masks humiliating are the ones who have to go into stores wearing them, not the people working in those stores. This is honestly amazing to me. If anyone has the right to be pissed about masks, it's the people who have to wear them for an entire eight hour shift, not the people who think it's lame that they need to wear them for the five minutes they spend in line at a cafe. But overall, the first mask mandate was very much observed, largely because it was tied into the war effort. Wearing masks wasn't just about protecting yourself or others, but rather a patriotic duty to help your country. There's a Red Cross PSA that said, The man or woman or child who will not wear a mask now is a dangerous slacker. I think that this shows that wearing masks is a very abstract action that in order to make sense of, people need to attach other broader goals to it in order to justify it. I think universally, it's a lot easier to be cool with wearing a mask for a set period of time to accomplish what seems like a real material goal. This also, to tie this into the present day, has to do with the types of groups masks are associated with, which in modern day Western countries are Asian people, Muslims, and Antifa. This is also related to how feminist scholars like Margaret Shildred and Elizabeth Gross have written about the ways that certain bodies are viewed as more permeable than others. Specifically, women's bodies, as well as those of Asian people who have traditionally been thought of as more feminine by Western colonists. But so, back to San Francisco, once the war ended, people very quickly stopped following the mask laws. Part of this came from people pointing out that aspects of the laws made no sense. Why they need to wear a mask in a park but could go to a crowded restaurant and take their mask off to eat. Also, city officials were being caught not following the rules. Hassler, along with the mayor and other high-ranking officials, were caught on camera at a boxing match not wearing masks. As Crosby writes, The worst possible fates finally overtook the masking ordinance it became funny. People would wear masks around their chins and doors, and when someone saw a cop coming, they'd yell, SUBMARINE, which was an old-timey slang term for cops, and then everyone would put their masks back on and scatter. Honestly, I think that we could bring that back. ASAP, baby. The city started conducting raids, fining, or jailing people for not wearing masks. There was also allegedly an instance of a cop shooting someone for not wearing a mask. Although, I say allegedly because the only source for this I could find was Crosby, and unlike every other claim he makes, he doesn't provide any sources, which like... You would think there would have at least been a newspaper article about something like that, but... Nope, I couldn't find anything. What the hell do you know, Alfred W. Crosby? What are you hiding? Soon, the mask ordinance in San Francisco was lifted. This was largely due to the fact that it wasn't really possible for it to be enforced. But also, to be fair, cases were by that point very low. And so this was what the city decided to highlight as their reason for lifting it. Everyone was told they could stop wearing masks because they'd been such upstanding citizens and done so much, which, to be fair, was at that point largely true. But wouldn't you know it, the virus came back. 
slowly at first, and mostly affecting immigrants and the poor, so no one paid it much mind. A lot of people just dismissed the new cases as the common cold. Also, there was one really weird article that blamed the rising cases on women not wearing shoes. Our women who appear on the streets barefoot, or nearly so, with their abbreviated slippers and thin stockings, are simply inviting an attack of flu. But soon, they realized it wasn't just barefoot women. The flu was coming back. Last time, masks helped so much, so Hassler said to put them back on, and the mayor agreed and brought back the ordinance. But it didn't work. People weren't scared anymore, and they were tired of this shit. Was it worth it? Do masks even work? There was an op-ed about a guy who was vaccinated, wore a mask, and still caught it. The title was, What's the Use? 90% of people didn't follow the new rules. And this is where we get our first organized anti-maskers. While no one except Hassler really supported the mask ordinance, the main charge against them was led by San Francisco's Christian scientists. Unlike regular scientists, Christian scientists are a sect of Christianity that forbids the use of basically all forms of medicine and instead relies on the healing power of prayer. An op-ed written by a representative of the San Francisco Church of Christian Science read, Christian scientists submitted to the closing of their churches and the wearing of masks as gracefully as they could while the epidemic seemed serious, expecting that these restrictions would be of short duration. To enforce the old mask ordinance or to enact a new one would ruin business, discredit the city in the eyes of the country, and interfere to an unwarranted extent with personal liberty. If anyone believes a mask will protect him from influenza, let him by all means wear one. Nobody objects to his doing so. But why should he, secure behind his mask, try to force masks on others? If they, without masks, take the influenza, they cannot communicate it to him. That was written 100 years ago. We've come so far. If that was written today, they'd probably also mention QAnon. The Christian scientists weren't alone, however. They were unsurprisingly joined by the city's libertarians. Together, the two groups created the Anti-Mask League. This part's honestly hilarious, though. The Anti-Mask League died out faster than a Christian scientist during a pandemic. They had exactly one meeting where they broke into two factions who spent the entire meeting shouting at each other. One faction was made up of the moderate members who simply wanted the new mask order repealed. The other was made of more radical members who wanted Hassler removed from office. I just love how quaint this feels. Like, if it happened today, the radical side would be insisting that Hassler was part of the deep state cabal and demanding he was hanged for treason. Anyway, they shouted at each other for like four hours until the absolute king who rented the venue that they met at stood up, called them all idiots, and then turned off the lights. Now, while the Anti-Mask League was a small and hilarious minority, no one liked or obeyed the mask laws. Newspapers were publishing articles about how masks weren't worth it, even though without them many more people would die. But Come on, what's more depressing, burying your loved ones or seeing people wearing masks during the holidays? If this wasn't obvious, the answer they came to was that people wearing masks were more depressing. And then on December 18th, 1918, a guy tried to send a bomb to Hassler. It wound up being delivered to the wrong address and also not going off. And this was also over a hundred years ago, so I think it's fine for me to make fun of this. The bomb was just a box full of gunpowder with a match attached to an alarm clock. Like, full-on Wile E. Coyote shit. After that failed, I'm surprised they didn't try to drop an anvil on him or paint a road onto the side of a brick wall. 
One thing that's interesting though was that most of the opponents of the mask mandate, at least those with much political power, were business owners who were worried masks would hurt holiday shopping. But at this point, the restaurant workers union joined them in fighting to get rid of masks. Hassler, classic lib, was shocked people weren't paying attention to the science and tried to convince them, which didn't go well. Ultimately, the mask mandate was rescinded, and Hassler said, the dollar sign is exalted above the health sign. And so, as you might expect, things got much, much worse. At the end of December, they had their worst days yet. Then, after New Year's, they reopened schools, and I'm shocked by this, actually enforced masks in schools, and then politicians started being like, yeah, maybe we should just go back to full masks after all. And this time, Hassler was even able to bring organized labor back over to his side. There was a city council meeting where the council was fully on board with masks, but citizens were not. For hours, citizens voiced their complaints about how masks weren't necessary and how you could cure the Spanish flu with healthy thoughts or some weird Russian superfood. The best part is one guy said that if it became a crime to not wear a mask, then they should arrest him then and there. And so, I cannot explain this at all, but it's amazing. The city council asked him to join them at the front of the room. I desperately want to know what happened here or what they thought they were doing. Did they just like his moxie? Was this some ill-conceived attempt at reverse psychology? Is asking to be arrested actually how you get on the San Francisco City Council? Just every high-ranking public official got their office by committing a felony? If murdering a man in cold blood is a felony, then arrest me now. My god, this young man's got gumption. Let's hear him out. Anyway, the mask mandate passed but didn't really matter since at this point literally no one took it seriously. Like, even with last time when no one followed the rules, at least they basically had masks that they'd pretend to wear. This time, people were like throwing on a loose silk scarf and calling that a mask. This story is kind of anticlimactic though, ultimately it turned out not to matter much since the warm weather and the vaccine ultimately caused cases to drop without the help of masks. Now, at this point I'm going to go into who opposed masks in 2020, but before I do, while this group does overlap massively with anti-vaxxers, I'm not really going to talk about them at all. For one thing, the clown prince of left tube H Bomber guy covered them in a new video in much more detail than I could go into here. Dude makes like one video a year and it had to be about this right now. Do you hear something? No! But also, as I said earlier, while anti-vaxxers are, and I can't stress this enough, very, very wrong, please get vaccinated, I can at least understand them. I mean, fear of needles is a common phobia for a reason. But also, there is a history of medical experimentation on racial minorities that makes it kind of make sense for, for instance, black people to be hesitant about vaccines. Or, for example, indigenous people were more than a little skeptical when Canada prioritized them as one of the first groups here to get the jab. Like, if there's one group the government of Canada has throughout its entire history up to and including present day demonstrated it does not give a fuck about the well-being of, it's them. But on the other hand, if vaccines weren't safe or did something sinister, the Israeli government wouldn't have prevented Palestinians from getting it. If the vaccines had mind-controlling microchips or something sinister in them, Palestine would have been fully vaccinated in under a week. 
I'm also not very interested in going into the reasons why these people claim they oppose masks very much. For one thing, because they're wrong. It's not harmful to wear masks and they are pretty effective at preventing the transmission of COVID. But also, I don't think these things are very important to anti-maskers either. While there are for sure lots of them who do genuinely believe this stuff because they've been fed a steady diet of misinformation, when you listen to a lot of their rhetoric, they tend to focus much more on how masks make them feel and what they consider them to be a symbol of. The bullshit medical pseudoscience then seems much more like a post hoc supplementary justification for what they already believed. You can especially see this with how some anti-maskers are now saying that they're going to wear masks, socially distance, and stay home once things reopen to avoid people who've been vaccinated. Finally, I'm going to be committing the cardinal sin of Canadian video essayists by talking about the place where I live instead of America for once. Ooh, do you hear that? That's my analytics plummeting. I think I lose a subscriber every time I say A. This is because I'm most familiar with my local brand of anti-maskers, as well as because since our conservative premier unsuccessfully tried to institute martial law, we are taking decisive action on the ground to dramatically step up enforcement. We have made the difficult but necessary decision to give police and bylaw officers special authorities to enforce public health measures. We have made the deliberate decision to temporarily enhance police officers' authority for the duration of the stay-at-home order. Moving forward, police will have the authority to require any individual who is not in a place of residence to first provide their purpose for not being at home and provide their home address. Police will also have the authority to stop a vehicle, to inquire about an individual's reason for leaving their residence. Ontario has become a bit of a mecca for people who now think that Doug Ford is a communist. Doug Ford has been elected Ontario Premier, and he looks like Sylvester when he just got caught eating Tweety Bird. I mean, he looks like the most guilty, lying, just disingenuous sack of garbage. I mean, look at him. It's like a giant demonic ferret. The co corruption, by the way, the I know this for 100% fact, absolutely confirmed over eight years of research. The entire Great Reset nonsense is centered in Toronto. And that's why Ontario is getting lit up right now. Which, given how he's used the pandemic to streamline evictions, completely decimating tenant rights, something which I have not seen any anti-masters talk about, I find the idea of him being a comrade pretty unlikely. And that's one of the big things you first notice about anti-maskers. They are extremely conservative. This is incredibly obvious to anyone who's followed this at all, but it's worth mentioning because it's something that they completely deny. But like... I don't know, if I was in a bipartisan group of diverse citizens concerned with government overreach, I'd find it odd if people were holding anti-abortion signs or Trump and QAnon flags at my protests in Canada. Or, I don't know, I'd be concerned if neo-Nazis were showing up to support business owners who stay open to protest masks and lockdowns while being totally not conservative. That's just me, though. One very useful quantitative study done throughout the pandemic found that the strongest predictor of someone being anti-mask is them being a Christian nationalist. Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that wants to elevate an ethnic identitarian vision of Christianity and make it synonymous with American culture. And when we say Christian here, that is definitely something of a dog whistle since it basically just means white. Christian nationalism doesn't involve a singular sect of Christianity, and many in the movement don't even regularly attend church. 
The point isn't really about religion, but about establishing a nebulous us and them. So while this is obviously extremely similar to white nationalism, the difference here is that they center a loose concept of Christianity as the key marker of group membership, although that is a very flexible term that often stands in for things like race, language, ethnicity, and citizenship. So while we might kind of just be getting into semantics here, the basic difference is that Christian nationalists are the type of people who will say they don't see color, whereas white nationalists will say that they very much do. There's not so much a difference in ideology as there is one in intensity. The big thing here though is that Christian nationalism is about combining Christianity with populist libertarianism. This stems from post-World War II during conversations around communism. Capitalism, specifically free market, neoliberal libertarianism, if you'll excuse the triple redundancy, became wedded to Christianity as a propaganda tool during the Cold War. Christian nationalism is all about viewing society in a hierarchical way connected to traditionalism and ostensibly tied to Christianity. They generally oppose science since it represents an opposing epistemology, especially in any case where it challenges religion on moral issues. This extends into kind of unintuitive places. Christian nationalists oppose basically all collective action, so things like government intervention in the economy are opposed, and instead they believe that something like the national economy will be fine as long as the moral fabric of the country is doing fine. Now, while I do not want to cut these fascists any slack, a big part of why the anti-mask movement exists has to do with the government doing a terrible job handling COVID-19. Just like a hundred years ago in San Francisco, when obviously irrational mask laws were put into effect, people figured that if that didn't make sense, the whole thing is probably bullshit. This is of course a batshit conclusion to come to, but hey, Christian nationalism's a hell of a drug, or healing crystal, or whatever. Now, this, like basically everything else, has become much worse than a hundred years ago, in no small part because of neoliberalism. As I mentioned in my Doomsday Prepper video, in his book The Culture of Control, sociologist David Garland argues that the reason crime prevention takes on such a prominent role in politics is because while politicians need to be seen as doing something, the fact that most political power has been handed over to corporations means that those politicians can't do anything that risks stepping on the toes of capital. And so, tough on crime policies emerge is a convenient place to be seen to wield political power without ever doing anything that will hurt the big corporations who really call the shots. And we saw this play out in Ontario, where in the face of record high COVID numbers, which every expert agreed were coming from non-essential workplaces, our premier, Doug Ford, banned all outdoor activities, issued a stay-at-home order, and gave police the authority to stop anyone outside their homes, aka Karl Marx's wet dream. Now, let's take a step back here and look at masks more broadly. Deborah Lupton, Claire Southerton, Marianne Clark, and Ash Watson present a socio-material analysis of the face mask in COVID times in their creatively named book, The Face Mask in COVID Times, A Socio-Material Analysis. Sociomaterialism is a field of analysis that views people as an assemblage of parts, in the same way that our bodies are a collection of cells coming together to make a whole, sociomaterialists argue that our personhood is not just our bodies, but an assemblage of the things we interact with and which allow us to exert or limit our agency. This all draws from something called more than human theory, which is based on certain indigenous philosophies dealing with the ways that who we are is constructed in dialogue with the various non-human things in our lives. 
One of the really interesting things with masks has been how they've been domesticated through incorporating them into our lives, as well as how values and meaning have been imposed onto them through custom masks with artwork or political slogans on them. What the authors of the Face Mask in COVID Times argue is that part of the motivation behind the anti-mask movement has been a resistance to the domestication and integration of masks into people's personhoods. But also, the virus itself has, from this perspective, become an interesting part of our personhoods as well, through how it's limited our agency and changed the ways we interact with the world, each other, and ourselves. But unlike masks, the virus has instead been a sort of non-entity and a non-event. As the French writer Michel Holebeck wrote, we find ourselves in the midst of an epidemic that proves to be just as boring as it is worrisome. A banal virus. Really not so different from any flu virus, but with unknown survival conditions, vague symptoms, sometimes benign and sometimes deadly, and not even sexually transmissible. In short, a virus without qualities. And while this epidemic can easily cause several thousand deaths in the world each day, it meanwhile produces the curious impression of being a non-event. Now, Holbeck got a lot of shit for that line, which is kind of fair to be honest. Like, people are dying and he's bored because the virus isn't sexually transmissible. Fuck you. But I also definitely get what he means. I've often thought how weird it is how these uncertain times will literally be in history books, and yet I never imagined that living through a historical moment would be so boring. I think that one of the defining aspects of the pandemic has been this sense of suspended animation, this feeling that the past year and a half hasn't been real life, but a transitory state. One example of this is how my friend Chill Goblin has done some work as an extra in TV shows over the pandemic and on set was told not to wear a mask while filming because it needed to be realistic. And so it's interesting how only now that we're coming out of the pandemic do we start to see media addressing it, but only in the past tense. One of the pretty cool things about living in Ontario is that there's no organization to our vaccine rollout, so instead of some centralized portal, everyone I know, including myself, who's gotten the vaccine, has found out about it through a Twitter account called Vaccine Hunters Canada, or seen their friends' Instagram stories, and that's how we find out where to go. <laughs> I was talking to someone about this after we both got our first vaccines, and they said how after all that we've been through, it felt really good to have some degree of control over our situation. I think one of the key motivators for anti-maskers has been the same thing. Refusing to wear a mask, while an incredibly selfish and stupid thing to do, is a very efficient way to exercise control during a year when all of our behaviors have been more thoroughly managed than I have ever experienced before. And finally, this brings us to the philosophies of Michel Foucault. Without going too into it, this is, after all, a channel for people who don't read theory by someone who doesn't read theory. Foucault was interested in the ways that different types of power control people. From feudal lords who'd exercise their sovereign power by maiming or executing individuals who disobeyed them, to more sophisticated ways that modern governments control whole populations through systems like education, prison, and even public health. In opposition to the philosophies of Descartes, which centered the individual, Foucault's central insight was that power creates certain types of people. Foucault's philosophy is basically just the new guy just dropped meme. And while I doubt that anti-maskers are particularly big fans of postmodern philosophy, this is an insight that I think anti-maskers are acutely aware of. 
Looking into the ways Foucault's theories can be applied to the pandemic, it's shocking to see how well they map onto anti-masker talking points. The use of contact tracing apps to enforce control through the collection of personal data, the use of disciplinary and sovereign power to enforce lockdowns and punish those who fail to comply, the ways people will internalize COVID restrictions and enforce them on others. When you strip away all the other bullshit talking points, I think the central anxiety that anti-maskers are acting on is a refusal to be shaped into this new kind of person. Now, this is not to say that there's some kind of revolutionary potential in the anti-mask movement, since what they're advocating for is an accelerated version of what I'd argue has always been essentially the status quo in which human lives are seen as expendable in service of feeding the death machine of capitalism. The thing that they seem not to grasp is that far from a communist takeover, what minimal COVID restrictions that there are have been enforced because actually people dying is itself bad for the economy. What I think that we're seeing here is a battle between competing, to use Foucault's term, epistemes or worldviews, which very crucially are based in completely different realities. And while anti-maskers do make up a mercifully small subculture, heads up, doomer shit incoming, Everyone existing in more or less the same reality is a precondition for the existence of a functioning liberal democracy. Yeah, th that's the conclusion. The real virus was fascism all along. Sorry to end on an abrupt and depressing note, but hey, there's a good chance that democracy will do the same thing. No, but honestly, I think that the thing I'm supposed to do here is say something like, make sure to reach out to people who've fallen for this stuff and talk sense into them. Or worse, something about how we can turn them into leftists by convincing them that instead of the Jews, it's the capitalists controlling things. But I don't think that that stuff works. You know, not telling you to like give up or consider these people a total lost cause, but I know someone who's gone deep into this and they're now posting things like how they can prove that Doug Ford is working for Justin Trudeau, which like, yeah, that's how government works. But the reason this is so difficult and also why they say stuff like that is because these people are operating on a different reality than we are, and I don't know how to fix that. Hey everyone, sorry for uh, doomering out at the end there. I may have recorded that on very little sleep. Thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. Big thank you to Alicia Wright for her rotoscoping work on this video. And big, big, big thank you to all of my amazing patrons who allow me to do this. Especially Christopher Tubbs, Vincent Lee, Jacob McDonald, Star Star, Strawberry Pup Tart, Selma Al Aswad, Jasmine Wellner, Acid Summer, Kelly Flynn, Scarebank, Eric Walker, AK, Bean the Roots, Isaac Slack, Hannah Diacom Rose, Dormitory Fedora, Rome, Serena Sinclair, Miko Polaris, Conrad Fox, Room for Cream, Nina Eck, Calvin Chris, Stu, Tori, Royal Road, Xander Corvus, Caleb Windsor, Madison Jacob, Matthew Costa, Billy and William Lambert, Weapon X Reject, Rachel Ann, Megan Gwynn, Andrew Ryan, Stitcher Ghost, Elizabeth Queen of Printers, Anime Avatar, Sarcasm I. Matt S, Carla Hoff, Jakey Stark, Winnie, Nathan Davis, Gregoria Three, Tesla Deathray, Niels Abelgard, G Alice, Alice Mattis, Hmm, Daniel Nisha, Local Sports Coach, Comrade Colson, Gene, Aldo Calrissi, Please No, Charles Ikawa, Buzz Killer, O Death, Heather Bone, Phil Argier. Thighs and French fries. Daniel Jocelyn, 
Maurice Robert, Tony Wise, Slithers, Joe, Ramsey Bargudi, Caleb F. Fales, Alec J. Radecki, J. Fraser Cartwright, Alex Harvey, Atomic Crimson, Charlotte Hollingsworth, Mary Page Evans, Josie Bennett, Aubrey Laboca, Brian Stadola, Miriam Marxista, Oryx Bible, Erica Sumrall, Netanyahu, Marina Dove, H. Johnson, Bill Nibs, Julia Soares, Cameron Hussein, Becca B, Just Oh No, Evan, Cody Stevens, Morgan, Max DeVos, Lucid Zen, Steven, Sean McIntyre, Max Gorenson, Alfonso, Jacob Friedman, G. Per, Casey Cutney, Juby, Nick Corbus, Ruby, Jamie, Kenzie G, Katzer Me, Arnez Collin, Agnes, Barroom Hero, Cancer Boys, Warren Helton Garner, Mac McGann, Matthew Piccarillo, Jovian S. Galtons, James Karen Nicholas, Costum, ESC, Muffalek Shin S, Leo Lane, Divergent Descent, Ellis McPick, Aislin, Jonathan McNabb, Alex Magic, Julie, Alistair Bush, Retro and Chill, Eric Crutchin, Miguel Crespo, Con Cox, Kevin Little, Mackenzie Lyre, The Magpie Mills, Emma Newton, Tyler Oldridge, Trenton Coleman, Max Elton, Thomas Brereton, Maddie G, Sith, Katarina, Gam, Relaxo, Tim Hopson, Nemo, Combat Side, Iso Kuhn, Rob Ward, Eric Pett, Joel Cresswell, Virtual Orality, Swarms McKenzie, Leia Shuster, Pandas Predicament, The Perfect Airball, Corey Beige, McGillis, Jess, Connor Mitchell, David Elliott, Trey Anthony, Alain Peel, Gonja420, Off Wears Hats, Nixon Checkers, AC Silleros, Jerry, Kill the State, Maya Solmir, Fuzz, John Mertz, Expat Cat Dad, 21st Century Bill of Rights, Chris, Randy, Rowanoke, Mitch Kennedy, E.H. Sawyer, Rioting Pacifist, Casey Young, Cafe Softy, Bruni, Red, Russell Gilchrist, Dylan Robinson, Bennett G. Spicer, The Silver Samaritan, Simon, Carrie M., Thomas Swords, Alexandra Falls, Christian, Subsystem of Society, Communist Android, Christina Davies, QTA10, Ron Doofdad, Jack Crawford, Lonely Party, Alex Arcudi, Eggsbox, Kennedy, Lolene, Christian Balhuis, Muppet Mistake. Thanks so much, everybody. Peace out.